Oh, okay, welcome to uh, week 16, if I have that right. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're getting close to the end of the semester. And the good news, I think, is that uh, I've gotten, including some late papers, which, you know, only is five points off at this point, uh, almost not, not quite everybody's paper yet. And I was, it took some doing, but I was able to, between the ones that I, you know, grade and the ones I send to my readers, it took me a while to find a reader even a, a, who would respond out of the three that I've worked with this semester. And uh, my most experienced reader who took this very same class, you know, obviously is quite qualified. She's been grading for me for three years, stepped up to the plate as this phrase goes, and she should have the grades to me no later than this weekend. So I should be able to get them to you hopefully before the Monday from a week from the day in your inboxes. Um, <clears throat> Okay, and of course, if you didn't turn your first paper in, let me do the speaker view thing here again. Uh, yet, uh, it's only 10 points off. It does have to go up. That is my policy. And of course, I have to enforce that. But you can make that up so easily with extra credit. Um, and and uh, as I've noticed, um, in fact, let me just take a quick glance. I'm not going to show the, this is the grade roster <clears throat> for this class, obviously. Um, I think a couple people have actually one or two people have 30 and one person has 40, but nobody has 50, 60 points or the maximum. And a lot of people haven't done any, and I'm not saying you have to do extra credit to, to do well in this class or that it's any kind of, you know, urgent thing. But if you think you might want to do that and you could benefit from the extra points as a cushion or margin for whatever happens on your last paper grade and of course the final you should do so soon because the um sorry adjust my <coughs> placement here in front of this laptop camera so uh, the point is that you have until the end of uh, final exams week but that's not a good time to be thinking about extra credit or you know whether you did everything you should have to get the best grade so it, it would probably be best to try and do that between now and the final itself which is three weeks from now. Um, but we'll talk much more about, we'll have plenty of time to review for the final and discuss how it's gonna be graded. And, and remember I'm gonna cut, yeah, let me get this extra. Justine. Hang on, so, there we go. Welcome, we're just talking about the fact that uh, we have uh, two more weeks of slides, uh, which I'm gonna give you guys, I hope you will agree, an early holiday present. I, I was gonna say Christmas, because you know, everybody said, oh, it's Christmas, but whatever you wanna call it, a uh, gift of some sort in that uh, there's one more must know, and it's very important. And there's, I have two different views of it because people don't recognize sometimes from any one photo what the thing is. It's called the Pyramids of the Louvre. There's a really strong backstory behind it that is inspiring to me because the architect was Chinese American and what he had to deal with to get the French government to accept his design. Well, actually they did. And then once it was found that he was A, American and B, Chinese, not French heritage. Well, we'll get to that. So that that what I'll do as I do with some where there's a lot more meaning than on average, then I will uh, go ahead and give you the main facts up front, and then I'll tell you the story and you could put your pens down or whatever you're recording with or writing notes with, and then summarize the main points uh, in the you know context, I call that. Uh, that's part of the meaning, of course, for in case it's on the exam. And it's one I won't cut. I'll, I'll say that as soon as we get to that slide, but a couple more announcements. Okay, um, has anybody, or actually a question, has anybody been to any of the major San Francisco museums, say, since about the 15th of October? Sorry, I... Yes, please, go ahead. Yes? Sorry, I thought I heard somebody, maybe. No, sorry, it's everyone screaming yeah, well, all that, that, that or... Sounds like somebody's uh, my... microphone. Yeah, anyway, the point is that I was hoping to hear some feedback about which exhibits people have found from any of my three art history classes. The, the new current ones that are they're good through the end of, well, past this to some good till February, they, they will be in place. Um, I know the Asian Art Museum has Asian art themes and I've heard, read good reviews, but I haven't talked to anybody who's been there. That's right across from the plaza from City Hall 
and the parking garage. Since it's not always safe to park your car on the streets of San Francisco, you know that these days is, is secure and it's right, the entrance to is right in front of the museum. Um, <clears throat> So that's one option. Another is the de Young, but you know, I think it's the Legion. Yeah, it is. Now I do know, not, uh, not none of my students, but one of my friends who was over for Thanksgiving, actually, that's how I know this, did go. And if anybody else to the, hearing this today has been, please let me know. I was there yesterday. Oh, the Legion of Honor. What did you see? Yeah, so I've actually been there twice since this class. And I got credit for one exhibit, but they have a new one, and it was pastels through the ages. Oh, and it was I want to hear cool. what what did you what kind of artist I can I've read about, but why don't you tell this class what? Yeah, uh, it was really cool. I, so they kind of it's kind of you know where they have the permanent collection, and then down they have like the featured exhibits, and they did it backwards. It was kind of smaller than some others, but it was really cool. They did it in kind of chronological order, and they started from like Renaissance times, oh. sort of or sort of pre, and Same saw the we're kind of, covering, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And we saw some artists. There were some artists there that I have some pictures of that we have covered that were so cool. And then Which it kind of went. Can you remember uh, one or two that we? Yeah, I think I, I took a couple of pictures. So let's see. Um, Renaissance. Yeah, from Renaissance to the present. Um, that's not one. Hoping I have a couple. Max Lieberman, James uh, McNeil right, Whistler. I don't think a quick swig of coffee. I barely had time to fix this before the class starts. Mm. Uh, like Monet, I think is one, no, or maybe it's Degas. I know Degas in there because I saw a picture from the Chronicles. Yeah, the Chronicles. And there were a couple of Degas, and then you know the Monets in the permanent collection, but they didn't put him down there. Although well, maybe they should have. The Renaissance, you remember any? Well, you're saying they were from our, or at least one or two of them were from our syllabus, which it isn't a requirement for you to get the extra credit. Any exhibit of visual arts. Uh, not performing arts, of course, would qualify for uh, 10 points once you show me the proof that you attended. So that's an easy and enjoyable and I think enlightening, if not inspiring way to go. So how long did you spend in the exhibit or how long do you think it takes for someone to see it without rushing? Um, we definitely hour? took our time and probably was, I mean, we took an hour, my brother and my mom and I took like an hour, but it's it's smaller than usual. It's only like yeah. those three or four main rooms and it's really spacious. So, so an hour is plenty of every single that. one, yeah. But you don't need to, you could do it in like 30 minutes and still look at everything. Okay, and any other things, uh, other parts of the museum that had special exhibits? Because the permanent collection I've already mentioned has in one room, it's the only world-class permanent collection. Uh, in the Bay Area that I, okay, let's put it this way, that are so famous there in textbooks that are part of the permit collection. And I think you may know that one. It sounds like you've been at the museum more, well, you just said a couple of times. And that's, I call it the um, 17th century room. It has a Rembrandt, uh, uh, a, a Rubens and two Van Dykes. All three of them were top notch uh, painters of the uh, 17th century, 1600s, of course. So that's- They like just rearranged a couple things though in the permanent oh. collection, which is kind of cool. Just a couple pieces that like weren't there and that were there now or like had been replaced and stuff, which was kind of cool. But um, yeah, that, that main room is awesome. And I actually, my first paper, I chose a piece from that room um, oh yeah, right. I give it. Well, it sounds like it, you've covered the basic overview of it, such that everyone who's listening and or hears this, this recording can can certainly find a, a plenty of things that are relevant and that maybe you would even know about from uh, previous lectures. Or you should go. It was beautiful. Yeah. Really fun. So so it's it's worth your time. In any case, it's it's worth ten points extra credit, and you get student discounts, don't you? I think you do. Right for for the admission, I don't know the what military and all that. If you're not a member, and and of course, and if you're not, it's only ten bucks anyway. So, oh, that's yeah. all. Oh, I thought it was twenty five, no. and then the discount was twenty. Yeah. Really? Hmm. You mean for the special? Oh, uh, I won on my team. Hey. Hello. I we got music accompanying us. Uh, <laughs> that's a new one. Tremolo, as we used to call those back in the days of garage bands where I grew up in part, part of my high school in Southern California. I'm from Chicago, but we moved to Southern California by which time the Beatles were top of the band. So everyone had to buy their own electric guitar even though they couldn't play and disturb their neighbors. Uh, anyway, back to that's a good, good museum to go to. And then the de Young, one more question then we'll, we'll segue into the slides. The de Young, has anybody been to that in the last, say, six weeks? The one in Golden Gate Park, which, of course, the parking is right underneath, and it's there's a security guard to let you into the museum at that 
uh, at the museum level, and that's a secure place to leave your car. Anybody been to the De Young and, and knows what they're, I can't remember. They have some, spot. well, they have one thing on at one of the first, or maybe the first really nationally known African-American uh, fashion designer. Uh, I think he designed mostly women's clothes. Usually they do, but I, he might have done some, some men's clothes too. Uh, and he was from the late 60s, was it? And all through into the 90s, I guess. So he's never had a show of his work, but I can't think of what else. To, oh, I know, there are paintings. Well, maybe you saw this, see, I don't know if it's at the De Young or the Legion of Honor, paintings by a Swiss immigrant artist from the early to mid 1800s, who was going up and down the coast of California, I believe before the gold rush, it would almost have to be, well, maybe could have been during and after and painting what we covered, remember Pomo and Miwok, the indigenous cultures that I had slides of that I took from, from that article that I wrote for the Marin Magazine. Now, a couple of you sent that link, by the way, you still can do that. That's an AG five points from November issue on the legacy of Chief Marin and the Miwok people. Uh, anyway, that that uh, culture and the Pomo, you know, just north of there, uh, of course, which is more, more so Sonoma County, they were where now Sonoma County is, and the Miwok were mostly where Marin County is now. Uh, and so those those uh, paintings, I think it's only a handful, but it, the, each one I've seen reproductions. Again, I think it was a review in the San Francisco Chronicle, or maybe it was a website. Those I think, but did you you didn't see those at the Legion? I'm sorry, I didn't remember who it was that said they went to the Legion. That would have been a separate Artists, small. Is it? Did you see paintings by an, any uh, immigrant European artist of Miwok and Pomo? I think they're at the De Young, not at the Legion, yeah. is what I'm saying. You can check their websites. Okay, that's, that's the easiest thing. But that would be an interesting sidebar. So any of those museums would work, but you can go to some local ones. The one on 4th Street, isn't it? In downtown Sonoma County Art Museum. They've had some good uh, uh, special exhibits. They're usually quite small and you can see them easily in half an hour, but that still counts, right? Uh, and then there is the art museum behind Anna Lee Hall, but I don't know that it's open regularly. In fact, I think you have to, you know. You, it's closed. Yeah, it's, it was when I, every time, when I'm up there in the evening with my daughter and, you know, taking, teaching, I mean, the un, only in uh, art history class up there that is mine, yeah. The, the one that she mentioned, San Francisco, it was for free because I only did my reservation online. And if you're an essential worker, it's free. Oh, essential worker, which yeah, it's really nice to hear. That that makes sense. It's, it's an appropriate uh, gesture. Well, yeah. Well, they're trying to get people more broadly interested in art, and that's the goal I've always had, and that many of you have already decided before you either took the course or maybe if not, perhaps by the end of this semester, some of that has stayed with you. Anyway, to me, art is so fascinating. It, oh, there's there's an exhibit of Bansky's. Hey, but that's somewhere else in San Francisco, not in one of the main museums. And I was so swamped this morning, I did not have time to, I may send an email, no, let's just say next class, probably on Wednesday, I can tell you where that is and, and the details. Uh, but you might be able to look that up yourself. It was reviewed in, in the back page of the Chronicle by a non-art critic, which is fine. The guy uh, is a millennial columnist. He writes some interesting stuff. Uh, and so he said it was not the best of Bansky's work, but worth seeing. Well, if you don't know who Bansky is, <laughs> no, we don't go off on that tangent. We don't cover that that late in this class, that period. Okay, so let us get to the first, uh, and uh, actually for today, it's the only remaining must know. Uh-oh, I don't see it. Where did it go? All right, I'll have to do that poll because I had it on the screen, but it, I guess I had it on there for too long. Okay, because I, I had to go out to my other computer, right, my uh, tabletop to do some files. And that's probably why. Hang on, it won't take too long, but we go pictures and then we go to like a minute or two here. Okay. There we go. Can people see this? I think you have to share your screen, Mark. Oh, I thought I did. Uh oh. Yep. You know what? And that's right. I had not. So let's get rid of the rest of these. Yeah, I've done this enough times. So I should have remembered that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then we go back. 
to the and that should do it get this out of here <clears throat> and enlarge this and hopefully everybody can see this now i can good okay yeah if one of you can see it i think everybody can i'm surprised this didn't just disappear you don't need to see my face well if we were in person it would there we go okay i'm going to turn on the fan believe it or not it's actually warm enough in my bedroom that the ceiling fan is necessary <laughs> it's 75 degrees here today which is really rare okay before we start the notes on this slide all right so this is uh at the end actually of well here we are it's still under uh, week 15, but as it turns out, we're actually in week 16 because, right, I told you we would overlap into the next week, last week. Okay, so it's in the last one under week 15. It's, the architect's name is Pi. Some people announce it Pay, but Pi is correct. And um, I, I like to emphasize more about him than most architects because he's a unique unique uh, person in the history of, of world architecture, not just American. Oh, somebody wants to join? Yeah, here we go. We just got started. You didn't miss anything. This is the, the uh, last slide on the list for week 15. I'll, I'll repeat the name of the architect, Pi, P-E-I. I am Pi, or Pei. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Uh, and then the title is Pyramids, plural, pyramids at the Louvre. I can never pronounce it correctly. My French friends always correct me. It's the museum, of course, the world famous museum. So pyramids at the Louvre, L-O-U-V-R-E. Okay. Pyramids at the Louvre, what does that mean? Well, what it implies is that this is info, I didn't give you the date. I apologize, 1989. That is an important fact, that date, because the reason these were built were there were uh, two reasons. First, to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution. Exactly, they, 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 the government of France under Mitterrand, you have to know his name, but for those few who have any interest in this, uh, he was a socialist, as in avowed, you know, sort of the you know, Bernie style socialist, and he had, it would shock people that he got elected head of the whole country, right? Because he wanted to be prime, you know, premier or president of France, actually president for many, many years. So he won an election and he decided that in order to celebrate early in the 80s, he was actually, he was around for a decade, uh, 15 years, I think he was longer than any other modern president of France. Would just say sometime in the 80s, earlier 80s, he looked forward to having a major monument and some would say to his ego, you know, that does have something to do with it, right? When, when the leader of a country wants to get some big monument built, it has something to do with their own ego. Some would say monumental ego, but it also benefit, he felt, the whole country and even by extension the world to the second reason besides just some kind of monument to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution. The other reason this was built is to make it easier to get into the Louvre than it had been for centuries. The Louvre had been open for almost 200 years by this time. Now it's well over 200 years. And I don't know, has anybody here been to the Louvre? I thought one or two of you said you had. Yes. Yeah. 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 You can you confirm uh, how long it, well, if you've been there in the last 30 years, it wouldn't matter, right? I, I went in the seventies and early eighties. It was an hour if you're lucky to get in, in line. And it didn't matter if it was pouring rain or, or bitter cold and, and snowing. It does snow. It gets cold in Paris in the winter. Uh, any time of the year, especially during high tourist season, you could end up having to uh, spend outside, <laughs> waiting outside in a line, and then getting into the lobby and waiting inside the lobby. Sometimes two hours was the average wait. Now, that's how you can summarize it. The average wait was two hours and people were complaining for obvious reasons. 
imagine some of them got sick don't worry at that but yeah why standing outdoors in december you know it's a that's a major tourist uh, you know christmas in paris is pretty amazing you know they decorate the city up like very few others london's the only other one that does even more of that in europe i mean so so he decided the president of france you have to know his name but it was Mitterrand with two t's uh he decided uh that he would hold an international competition to design a new entrance to the louvre Hundreds of architects, and I'll repeat this to summarize it, uh, hundreds of architects uh, submitted uh, ideas. And the winning design was this one, the one that is there now. Now, let me pause. If you're taking some notes, you know, imagine <laughs> you like a pause. Anybody could tell me, there's a couple of you, I think just now said you'd been there. So I assume you went after the pyramids, plural. Were, were there, how long did it take you to get into the museum? How long did you have to wait? Um, I got in in five or 10 minutes, but I didn't go through the pyramid. Oh, anybody gone through the pyramid? I have, and I could tell you how long it took me, but I thought I'd ask anyone else. I haven't been to Paris since 04, but I've been about three or four, no more than that, probably six times. Uh, since they opened the, 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 the pyramids. This entrance this is the main entrance now. How did you get in if you didn't go through the pyramids, by the way? This uh, is not the right I'll thing. recommend in the class, if anybody goes, do not go through the main entrance. Uh, you can go on uh, undergroundtourist.com uh, and it tells you there's a whole separate entrance on the back side of the main wing that you're looking at right now. Yeah. Um, and it's an open entrance to anybody. No one's ever there. And I tell you, it must have taken us literally like a minute or two. You just you just walk in. Um, but don't they have to take you? They do charge for it. I, I mean, some days. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't get in for free. I'm yeah. just saying there's an entrance with no okay. lines. And it's all it, it's always vacant. Don't ask me why, Mark. It's one of those weird little things that people. Just yeah, talk. interesting. Wow, <laughs> you you could uh, you know I, get a whole bunch of extra followers and become an influencer if you if you didn't already. Yeah, it, it's try it's to do there, that. It's there I've on never the heard that. Brand, Paris buddy. is my favorite yes. city. I've been to Paris more than any other foreign city. It's my favorite big big city in the world, and I have friends there. See, so I was I was able to stay with them, and luckily, <laughs> and they spoke French, and my French is not that good. Well, I'm not gonna I, see. This is f fun, actually, or funny and fun. It's good that you brought that up for a lot of reasons, but it's interesting because it, I could say it undercuts what I was about to say. However. Not if everybody see, this is a valid point. Now, I'm going to tell you when to start taking notes again. So you can just listen. If everybody started or large numbers, let's say, if people started doing that, there'd probably be some kind of a shift in, in their process or procedure. Because the point of this entrance, this main entrance, there's two reasons for it. Most people come through this entrance. Now, you should start taking notes again. And it is protected and I'm going to show you the view that if it's on the exam, that's the view we'll have. It's a beautiful site. And this uh, entrance protects people while they are on either an escalator or waiting in this huge, wonderfully well lit and beautifully uh, decorated lobby. Because when I say decorated, it sounds like they put a bunch of fancy things on the walls. No, they just have the different... Uh, wings of the Louvre because it's so but you can't see anywhere near half of it in one day in fact I don't think anyone's ever seen all the art there it's the biggest art museum on earth yeah and so you know the Mona Lisa is above one entrance so even if you didn't read the yeah, animal of course they have English French German and I forget maybe Spanish and then possibly by now Mandarin and one or two other languages that say which wing is for which section and which paintings are in each section but when you're standing there you're out of the cold or the rain or the weather. In other words, you're protected from the weather. So what you do now, sometimes let's go back to the other view here. Sometimes, uh, especially at Christmas, there can be a line to get, you know, with the, that's enlarges again, to get to where you can enter this, uh, there's an escalator. I think you see this, I wish it was a slightly larger, but this is the best view I could find that was not copywritten. Um, <clears throat> And so what you have is of daytime view, I should say. So what we have is people can occasionally wait. The longest I've ever heard anybody wait is half an hour and that's rare. 
And that includes getting into the pyramid. And then most of your time is in a climate controlled, you know, very, uh, you know, comfortable environment. And you're on an escalator that will take you down to that um, uh, open forecourt. And then, you know, of course, you go ahead and buy your ticket. And there's multiple lines. It's it just very well thought out. There are so, and plus the best food court I've ever been to. I don't know if you got together. I forget who it was. I said you, you'd been there, right, through the other entrance, <laughs> the lesser known one or little known one. Did you ever get to the food court? Because that is an incredible experience. And that's on the level where the entrance is once you get down below the pyramid. And you can have access to that. And of course, all the comforts, you know, that coat check in the course. Uh, whatever, you know, renting earphone, whatever, you know, it's all in one place. And uh, you don't have to wander around looking for stuff. It, it just put it this way. Now, if you're taking notes back to what you should write again, is that um, an American, Chinese American architect named I am, he, he puts his initials, that's, I don't even remember if his first name, if he's ever used it, as in capital I, if you're writing these notes, thoroughly you go ahead and put his first name but you won't need to know it for the exam he just puts his first and middle initials on all his work everywhere in the world he's designed buildings all around the globe he was he died about two or three years ago at 101 or two years old an amazing man he started his career in the 1930s <laughs> and he was still designing buildings well into the 2010s uh, his buildings are in Hong Kong. He, for a while, he had the tallest skyscraper in Hong Kong. Then in Washington, D.C., he designed the National Gallery, the new one, which is beautiful, and on the mall. He won a competition for that. He designed the Rock and Roll uh, Hall of Fame Museum. I think it's in Cleveland, as of all places. Yeah, it is, in Cleveland, Ohio. And a couple of other buildings in uh, uh, Seattle uh, and other big American cities, but his work is world famous. And he was, um, you know, originally his parents came from mainland China. So here we have a, an American citizen who was living in the US, submitted his proposal, and maybe they didn't know by the spelling of his name what uh, you know ethnic origin he was. But when it was finally revealed that he won the competition, all hell broke loose. So it's part of the meaning. Now, if you want to just listen to this part, then I'll summarize it, because I find it uplifting, although aggravating and and you know infuriating that he even had to go through this. All kinds of nasty nativist stuff first came out, which happens in every country, sadly. I mean, it just tends to. Certain people want not to have anyone outside their country design anything of importance in their national you know, sphere, or in the, the, let alone the capital. Of course, it's the capital of the whole country of France. Uh, that was one, one objection. Why are you hiring a foreigner? Well, the competition was international. That was a given when Mitterrand announced it, when the president announced it, he, he opened it up to get the best plans. The second thing, the objections was that he wasn't a French heritage and that smacks of, well, maybe just a little bit of racism. Uh, and the fact that he was Chinese American, I don't think anyone made that specifically, you know, an objection, but th it was implied. Uh, and then finally was when the plans were revealed to the public for comment, uh, there were some people who just objected to it on aesthetic grounds. He said, oh, that'll completely ruin this wonderful plaza between the two wings of the Louvre. And if you don't know, this is part of the meaning you should write. The Louvre is the former palace of the presidents of, I'm sorry, <laughs> former palace of the kings, royal, in other words, palace of the kings of France for hundreds of years. It's a Renaissance building. If that's not you know, clear from the photo, maybe you can tell by you know some of the decorations here. Th these buildings go back 500 years. So it is true, it's, it's not in context or in keeping with the historic nature of the buildings around it. But I don't see it as a problem because, and most people don't now, it's, it's generally well respected and, and well liked. And the people of Paris have said they're proud of it now. <laughs> Even some who probably objected to it back when it was first proposed. So he had to fight that battle. And uh, to his credit, the president of France, Mitterrand, backed him up all the way and said this is not what we want to be known for you know this kind of prejudice against you know 
somebody just because he had the best design. And now most people agree. Although, like I said, <laughs> I forget who it was that just brought that up about the um, unauthorized or is it just little known and whatever alternate entrance. For most people that won't work. Maybe the <laughs> your, your own contacts will know about it, but it's not, it, most people have to go through this entrance. If they didn't, they wouldn't be able to, uh, uh, you know, get in, right? Or know how to get in. So let's do this. If it's on the exam, this is the view. By the way, now I think you can see the building uh, behind or around it. I mean, it's, it, it's a horseshoe shaped courtyard. These, these buildings were built over a decade, many decades to house the royal family and all the other people associated with uh, the king and his governments uh, for hundreds of years. It was Napoleon. One of the positive things he did, and most of the stuff he did wasn't so positive. But in terms of this cultural thing, here we go. Um, this is an important part of the last part of the meeting is that the, the, the Louvre was opened uh, by Napoleon over around 1800 uh, because he decided that it shouldn't just be a private palace anymore. And he didn't like living there anyway. <laughs> he preferred a different palace. He became just as much a dictator as the king he overthrew or helped overthrow. But in the meantime, he, he opened the world's most famous art museum well over 200 years ago. So you go through this last part about the meaning now is that how it works is that you go through, if you didn't write it before, I'll summarize, the, through, through an entrance, which you can't see in this view, I actually was hoping to have one where people are standing just in front of the, the, the entryway. And then you go down an escalator down to a, uh, it's called a forecourt. I think that's a, I think that's a French word even, where you can buy your ticket and get any kind of guided, so, you know, whatever it is, you know, earphones or guidebooks, and you know, you know, the restrooms and all that, and the food court and everything. And then you can decide which wing you want to go to first, and guess which wing most Americans make a beeline for. La Giaconda. You guys know this. We covered it. You don't have to write this now, it's too detailed to be part of the meaning of this slide. But the point is most Americans don't realize that in Europe, they don't call the Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa. Somehow that happened when Americans started talking about it. I don't know why. The right name is La Gioconda. So, but just in case you're not sure where the Mona Lisa is, I think they've added that underneath the, the correct uh, French or Italian, especially Italian uh, name for that woman. And there's a picture, you know, reproduced of her, by the way, uh, the person who, sorry, uh, if you're still with us, Craig, who was going through the alternate entrance, did you go see the Mona Lisa? Of course. Yeah. I'm going to ask, I think I'll know, I know what you'll say. What was one of the most surprising things you found out about what when you finally saw it? Uh, two things. One, um, it's smaller than somehow yeah. I had it in my head. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, Every and the other thing is, no matter when you go, there are hordes of people. Uh, it, yes, it's, it's amazing. You have to wait yeah. and wait and wait just to be able to get up close to it. Yes, you do. You have to be patient. Now that's a kid. There's no alternate <laughs> route to that. Unless you know one of the curators or you're Tom Hanks character in the Da Vinci Code and you get to go into the museum at night. There's a movie you could watch. I'd give you credit for that. It's, it's not very well made. Tom Hanks himself said he was embarrassed with how badly <laughs> done the script was, but it's from the best-selling novel of the last 30 years. The Da Vinci Code has sold over 30 million copies. And it starts with a murder in the Louvre at night. And he's a professor of symbolism and essence of version of art history in which he's called in to consult and see why is the corpse marked with these symbols, right? So it's mostly a murder mystery, but it has a lot to do with the actual art and historic relics of uh, France and uh, actually also Scotland. So, so I would qualify that as another option where you watch a movie, right? There's at least two hours. I'm sure it's at least that long. And then, or, or sorry, over an hour. And then write two pages about what you learned about the history of that. Now, it's not about the life of an artist, but I'm giving you some flexibility for those who might want to, you know, like I said, it's not the best movie about, but it shows the Louvre to really great effect. And, uh, and yeah, what you just said about Mona Lisa is what everyone I've talked to has said and what I felt the first time I went, when I had to wait two hours outside in the cold with my then girlfriend to get in the old entrance before these pyramids were built. Yeah, once you get to it, it's so much smaller than you expect, and the crowds are just thick as thieves around it. Actually, it was stolen once, too, as you remember, perhaps. But we're not being tested on the Mona Lisa, of course, for the final. You, you might be tested on this. Okay, let's do our formal analysis, and then I'm going to what I'm going to call uh, 
to give you guys a treat uh, for the next day and a half or so. And we're going to end a little early tonight. Tonight, see, I'm so used to teaching at night. Most of my classes have been at night. I'm sorry. In uh, probably around four. Well, no, the rate we're going, it'll about about ten after. Yeah, we'll see. I want to start with and then resume on Wednesday slides of Julia Morgan and Bernard Maybeck's work. And if you haven't, as I know, most of you said you hadn't been to Hearst Castle. That's a treat just to see how it looks inside. And these are spectacular photos that I couldn't have taken by a full time professional photographer with his own lighting equipment and everything that are in my book on Julia Morgan, but also uh, just really good views that you can see for yourself why that's that space is so spectacular designed by the first independent woman architect. And then a couple of other surprising places you can go see you could for extra credit, though not many of you are likely to get all the way down to Hearst Castles halfway to LA. But some of the Bay Area sites uh, you might be able to go to, uh, especially in the Berkeley campus that she she and Maybeck designed uh, for you know the architecture uh, ten points extra credit option. But we'll we'll do that as soon as we finish the formal analysis. This is balanced completely. Uh, if you stood in front of each section, it would be balanced, of course. Now it depends if you know if you stand here and you get like this guy, he's walking along this very narrow path. I didn't even know they let you do that taking a picture going up this uh, spine of the one side of this pyramid. So yeah, however you slice it, it's balanced like all pyramids would be left to right and unbalanced toward the bottom. It's a warm color at night, but let's see in the daytime, it's neutral. So I don't know any other way to write it because it's, it's, it's a transparent glass with black painted metal framing. So you pretty much have to just write it that way that it is uh, uh, neutral, uh, you know, uh, transparent and black colors in the daytime and at uh, night slid up with a uh, yellow, you know, warm colors, uh, almost gold look. Uh, okay, then we obviously the rhythm's powerful of all the framing of the, of the glass panels. It's dynamic. I don't see a straight line in it unless you, well, you could say the base on each of the sides here. Hang on, let me just do one more thing here. Yeah, uh, you could say the bases. Yeah, the, the, the bottom, the beams along the bottom are. But this is the view you'll have though to write from. Yeah, I guess you could say that. Because from this angle, they look they look like diagonal lines, but they are straight. So only the base is stable. Everything else is completely dynamic. There is no larger or smaller mass here. Oh yeah, actually there is. I misspoke, sorry. There are actually uh, are three pyramids. This one is a ventilation shaft. And this one, oh, they both are. So there's two pyramids for ventilation to keep the temperature even comfortable and you know efficient. It's a it's a green building in that sense or structure. It's not really a building, right? Obviously, the buildings are around it. Uh, but the point is that that uh, I am Pay is one of the first architects to think about that about environmentally efficient design. So the, the, it's temperature controlled in a way that is very environmentally responsible okay we'll put it that way so there's three pyramids so the largest mass obviously is the main pyramid in the middle and then equal the second largest there's only two masses are the two flanking ventilation shafts or pyramids used as ventilation shafts okay and then we have for space it's about a, a 45 foot high open pyramidal <laughs> Space. You have to describe the space in the two smaller ones. There, there, no one goes in those, so this is the uh, only open space. And then there is, but you do need to add, down below it opens into a very large courtyard. Forecourt is the right word. Courtyard sounds like an outdoor space, so forecourt is a better word, uh, which, which is the en or entrance court. You could say it that way. Much, it's much bigger than, than, than the pool and pyramid combined. It, it goes for, I don't know how many hundreds of yards in each direction. Uh, it, it, that's part of why there's no crowds anymore. We're very, you know, relatively faster access is because of the way I pay. He's an engineer too. He was trained both as an architect and engineer. You don't have to add that, but that's part of why he came up with this idea that a lot of regular architects wouldn't have thought of how to get fast flowing. You know how many people on average go to the Louvre every day? It's well over a quarter of a million. Thousand? Yeah, hundreds of thousands, a quarter of a million in one space, sometimes three, 350,000 on, on like during the Christmas holidays, which is their peak season, by the way, for this museum. And now you don't usually have to wait outside for more than a few minutes to get into the, uh, you know, temperature controlled uh, pyramid 
sphere and then down to the courtyard. So just say that it's uh, two main areas or spaces, of course, the real space, about a 45 foot high pyramid shaped entry and a very large open, uh, uh, in, uh, sorry, when I say open, I mean the floor plan is open forecourt below ground. Those are the two main spaces. And then we have, uh, let's see, color I already mentioned. Oh, texture, yeah, it's real smooth metal and glass. That's it, there's just two textures. Uh, there's no modeling here. Let's see, in the daytime, I wouldn't say there is because transparent glass doesn't really uh, cast shadows, right? So there's no modeling here. And let me see, am I forgetting something? Balance left to right, I think that's it, mass. Oh, line, yes. The lines here are visual. Uh, and those are formed by the framing of the glass panels. And the, of course, including along the edge of the building. So they're thick or bold at the corners and the bottom, thin visual lines along the, the sides. Okay, everybody got, anybody need me to uh, repeat any of that? Let me just do one thing. I'd forgotten I had this, this close up capacity. Yeah, you can see the difference between these two structures. And at first when I, I went there, I didn't expect to like it. I thought it might be so out of place that I, I would understand why some people were critical of it, not just in France, but even other parts of the world. But a lot of people who had been there before me, I didn't get there when it first opened in 89. I think the next time I went was 90, yeah, 91 or so. <clears throat> um, but it had been open for a couple of years. And by that time, people were saying how wonderfully easily accessible was, but not as easy as this your fellow student described <laughs> the alternative way of getting in, but still way easier than the uh, old method of waiting in line to get in this door here for hours. Yep. Okay, so let's do the stop share on this. And then I am going to need to shift to, um, let's see, where are we? USB drive but I'm not sure when I do this, I think I still have to do the screen share for you to see these. Yeah, I didn't wanna show you that one, but let me start by asking, you probably can't see this, right? Correct? I cannot. No. You can't, okay, good. Here we go. All right. Yeah, there we go. Now, can you see it? Yes. Oh, good. Yes. Okay, let me start out with the fact that Bernard Maybeck was mostly concerned with the fact that other architects, you have to take notes now, okay? But his buildings, this building was on the UC Berkeley campus for decades, it burned down an accidental fire after about 30 some years. So it's not there now. But another building that's in its place, I will show you, and it is open to the public, and it's beautiful inside, and you'll see why I say that. We'll probably get to that on Wednesday. But these slides are uh, for a presentation I made to the Walt Disney Museum. Do you know where that is? There's another museum you could go to of cartoon art. That qualifies. It's in the... Uh, San Francisco? Yeah, in the Presidio in San Francisco. Yeah, look it up in there. Actually, I think that's where the Banksy exhibit is. Because Banksy did a, an illustration of, a, of one of those horrible incidents from the Vietnam War where a, yeah. a famous photo of a, of a young girl who had been, uh, you know, injured severely, burned by napalm during the Vietnam War, crying. And then uh, on either side of her are Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck walking along beside her. You know, that's typical Banksy. Right, I forget the title of it. But I don't know if they'd put that in the Disney Museum. <laughs> in any case, that museum has always got something interesting. And there's films shown too. You'd have to check their website. The Walt Disney, I don't know if, what exact title is, but you, it would have, if you put Presidio San Francisco, it'd come up. Uh, that'd be worth 10 points extra credit and maybe a lot of fun to go to. So the point is I showed these slides to that group because they asked me to do, you know, it was an auditor of about 150 people. And so they said, can you show us examples of collaborations between Bernard Maybeck and Julia Morgan. Well, this building was designed in 1899. Now, I don't know how it looks to some of you, but let's do it and see if we can do an enlargement. 
it was so different than anything anyone had seen before. The only thing historic at all is that giant pointed arch, that Gothic arch in the middle. So that part might resume, resemble, I mean, a train station in parts of Europe mostly, right? In big cities in, in Western Europe sometimes. But the rest of it is, yes, environmentally sensitive design because it's all local natural materials, redwood um, shingles and uh, framing. Uh, and then inside there's some lighter wood, you know, that also is more resistant, some of it to, it, well, actually redwood's pretty resistant to uh, dry rot. And it's totally resistant to termites. So he designed the building with the idea of it being a, a women's recreational center. And he was inspired to do it by having had a student, a young woman named Julia Morgan. And we're gonna to get to her work certainly before we call it a day now and then see more or most of those slides on Wednesday. Uh, but so Maybeck was the head of the only architecture, or I'm sorry, I meant to say the instructor at the UC Berkeley architecture there was there was no program. So I started to say program, and it didn't exist. He's the first instructor to teach architectural design, and his classes were always full of people who went on to do really good things in their own right, the most famous of which was Julia Morgan. We'll talk about their connection, and, and they actually collaborated on projects. This is strictly a Maybeck design, but when talking to her and other female students uh, at UC Berkeley in the 1890s, he realized they didn't have their own recreational space. And uh, he thought he would design one for them with the, and he got the, the funding for it from Phoebe Hurst. And I should go back to that. Some people know this story, but I'll, I'll keep it brief. She's one of the last people to die in the great uh, Spanish flu, they call it the epidemic of 1918 to 20. She died just before it ended. Um, <clears throat> somehow survived like, you know, happens, you know, maybe almost two years of that pandemic. It lasted just about exactly two years uh, before it somehow disappeared. We don't even know why it did. Uh, she was a victim of that. But before she died, she was um, a supporter of women's rights and women's cultural organizations. And Maybeck was very much in line with that. So she liked his philosophy. He went to her and said, um, some of my female students point out they don't have a recreational space. And she said, well, I can take care of that. In case you don't know, she was one of the richest women in the world. And William Randolph Hearst, who was the first media mogul we've covered who he was when we saw her, uh, one slide ahead of Hearst Castle that might be on, has a good chance of being on uh, Julia Morgan's design for the main building, Casa Grande. You definitely, if you didn't see that lecture, you want to go back and review that lecture that covers her work. In any case, the point is that, th that this woman was ahead of her time in many ways, and uh, she could make things happen back when you didn't have a lot of other impediments like, you know, committees, <laughs> right, and environmental reviews. If she wanted something to happen on the UC campus or anywhere else where she had influence in Northern California, including helping create a Silomar, we covered that too, it remembers one of the other must-know slides of Julia Morgan design. She, she got it done. So she said, okay, I, uh, and that's funny, I don't know why I put that little one in there, but this, this building was, uh, so in other words, a joint kind of a project between uh, Maybeck, the architect, totally on his own, no one else helped him with the design, and then um, Phoebe Hurst is the promoter, and women benefited from it for over 20 years because they had this space where they could, you know, everything from their own exercise in a safe environment, and of course, uh, you know, also, they're healthy, right? They could take classes. Of course, they were being offered by that far. In fact, uh, various women's sports were already being played on the UC and other college campuses. Okay, here's William Randolph, as you may have heard me mention. He was really, most people agree, the, the first media mogul in America. He owned hundreds and literally hundreds of newspapers. What's his name? William Randolph Hearst and Hearst Castle was named for him. And some of you may know that uh, the Hearst family still owns the Chronicle, all right, the main newspaper in Northern California. In fact, it's the only daily newspaper coming out of San Francisco. We used to have get this over a hundred newspapers once upon a time in San Francisco. We know newspapers are a thing of the past. However, I still subscribe and so does a half a million other people. So he, he uh, started um, or, or bought and, and was the owner of hundreds of newspapers all over the United States dozens of magazines. And then when radio came in, 
literally hundreds at least a couple hundred radio stations and then movie uh, studios he had he owned two or three of them and so he was the first true media mogul and uh, he had a, a fondness for the berkeley campus you'll see the evidence of that which we'll probably get to like i said on wednesday uh, for a project in honor of his uh, recently deceased mother, but that's that's a little ways down this presentation. So that's just a view of his rather imperious. He was a bit of a oh, just a little egotistical, right? But one of the projects he he wanted uh, Maybach and Julia Morgan to collaborate on was um, this chalet. He called it. He wanted for a retreat in a place called Windtune, which no one outside of the Hearst family and their invited guests is ever allowed to go see. I tried to get permission with me and my photographer to go photograph it. So the photos you're going to see of it, you will see a few, and it's spectacular, are archival that were taken by photographers way back when it was first, uh, you know, um, used by the Hearst family. So the Hearst family has a private estate up in the mountains. I think they're called the Siskiyou Mountains. Anyway, just at the northern edge, just below the Oregon border. And they have had it ever since this, this is 19, about 1904. So Julia Morgan collaborated with Maybeck on this project, uh, but he was the architect of record, but she had just gotten back from Paris. I, I already covered this, so I won't rehash all of that about her amazing ability to overcome hurdles to get through roadblocks of sexism and people who didn't think a woman could design or should be allowed to design any public building. I mean, they could design homes, sure, that's fine. They're good in the kitchen, you know, that kind of thing. So she broke that barrier, that glass ceiling. Sorry, I'm hearing some background noise there. <laughs> Hopefully that will <laughs> subside, thank you. So this is a kind of a Bavarian, he called it, the Maybach himself called it Bavarian Castle. And Julia Morgan just assisted him here, but she did do some of the drawings. She had just gotten back from Paris a couple of years earlier. In fact, it's 03, so literally a year earlier. You don't have to know any of these dates or any of this information, but it's burned down. Unfortunately, that happened to a lot of wooden buildings. And of course, we've seen the evidence of that in the last few years all around Northern, well, California, not just Northern California. So this survived well into the, the, the 30s and then it, it burned down, but it was a nine story. That's what's hard to see in this photo. It's the best photo I could find. Again, it wasn't copywritten uh, with a stamp over it. Uh, and it was a uh, entertainment, recreational family. I mean, it was a big family, right? When you start adding up all the multiple numbers of, you know, relatives, in-laws, and so forth, they often had a couple, well, maybe not 200 people, but 100, 150 people would stay there at any one time. But it is a private residence. Uh, it was, I'm sorry, it was a private residential retreat. Okay. Maybach was the Arctic of record, but Julia Morgan assisted him. Now, here's the man we've been talking about. Now, this guy is often referred to as the first hippie architect. I've heard people say that. When you consider that most architects at this time, you know, if they had any facial hair, maybe, but they didn't have this kind of bohemian lifestyle. And he did. If you look uh, in any file or, or, you know, online source and or by any chance you get a copy they're they're in the uh, two libraries well actually i don't know about the library on the petaluma campus yeah yeah they do what am i saying and the one on the main campus i know that's late in the semester uh you could get extra credit that way you know by you know writing something about his uh, his life he was unusual uh he was for women's rights he was definitely an egalitarian in the way he treated people from all around the world. He supported, uh, you know, students in, you know, all every way he could in their career choices, including Julia Morgan. He told her, you should be the first woman architect with your own office. Uh, might not have had her career without his in inspiration and encouragement. And, and yes, he actually intervened when they tried to reject her the second time from the Paris School of Architecture. I told you about that before. So he was one of those people that was enlightened, I'd like to call it. So here he is as a, as a student in his um, freshman, uh, sorry, I mean, as he graduated from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, this is what he looked like at, at 24. Coming back from the top school of architecture in the world and you know, on fire to do new things. Um, Here's how he looked late in his life. You can see that from the date here. Well, you wouldn't know he was born in 1862. So by this time he was in his seventies and his own house and several others had burned down his own son's house and uh, uh, his uh, granddaughters where they were living in a house he built for them and about 
15 or 18 other Maybach design houses in North Berkeley all burned to the ground in uh, the fire of 1923. It was the biggest fire, urban fire in the Bay Area after the earthquake of 1906, which of course was started by an earthquake. So some people don't even call that an urban wildfire. The one in Berkeley, seven, almost 700 buildings were destroyed and it, it burned all the way into almost downtown Berkeley. Pretty, pretty severe. And it skipped some sections and neighborhoods, but unfortunately the area where he lived and designed many homes for people that were family members or, or you know clients uh, that wanted to live in that area. It's North Berkeley and guess what they call the neighborhood? It, Nut Hill. <laughs> because of the eccentric character of the people or the nut trees that grew there, the debate still is not decided as to why that, that part of North Berkeley got that name. So he had to rebuild. I mean, in his late 60s and early 70s, his task was to go back and redesign or even do a new design for these buildings of his that had just been there maybe 20 years or more and had just burned in this horrible fire, including his own residence and his other uh, family members. Now, this is Julia Morgan in Paris. And I mentioned this before, but I'll summarize it briefly because I don't think everyone uh, has yet heard that part of the lecture, but there'll be a slide of one of, if not both of these architects on the final. She's in an apartment in Paris. She'd already taken, when this picture was taken, she had already taken um, the exam and passed in the ten, top 10% at the Col Beaux Arts. Again, you won't have to know this now, but it is something I told you guys, and you should have notes from the lecture we did on her work about uh, three lectures back. Uh, you know, just check the syllabus and they're all on YouTube by now. Okay, so she she was rejected, even though she should have been admitted because their rule said the top 10% of candidates who tested in the top 10th, uh, she should be admitted. So she had to take it two more times. And after the second time she was in the top 5%, that's when Maybach started writing angry letters to the admissions commission uh, there or committee, whatever they call themselves, in Paris. And he even went to Paris. He had other reasons to go, but he talked to them in person. So you see, he really did lobby for her to be given fair treatment. And finally, they were too embarrassed after her third try, her third time of taking the exam, she was in the top 3% <laughs> and they couldn't turn her down there because even people in the press, me uh, Paris media, the, the press mostly, of course, we're talking about newspapers, uh, but even some people in the architect's profession you know, in France said, hey, come on, let this woman in. She's proven that she's more qualified than most of the male candidates. Here she was in her uh, mid, let's see, I mean, she was born, you know, her 150th anniversary of her birth coming up and there ought to be some celebration for that. Maybe I'll do something about that. And next semester, if you take one of my classes, you'll get extra credit if uh, it's safe to attend some events in public, who knows. Anyway, so she was born in the 1870s, 1872 in, in Oakland, actually. So she she was a native of the Bay Area. And by the time she got to, to, to Paris, she was already, at 25 going on 26 and she had to wait two years to get into that school because of those uh, you know uh, discriminatory rejections but she was patient and when she graduated she was just under 30 with her degree in architecture and this is her she was only 90 pounds and five feet tall next to Hearst who was uh, obviously sort of you know kind of full <laughs> Uh, um, and, and the two of them are standing in front of a building. You're going to see those buildings now in the next uh, few minutes, at least the first few, and we'll end about 10 after, if that's okay. Now, stick around for questions, I always do, and we'll see much more of Hearst Castle interiors and spectacular buildings. If you haven't been there, I think this might make a couple if you want to go when you have a chance. Uh, actually, not even sure if it's open. I'll check on that. I will double check if it's open to the public this at this point in, in our history. I'm not sure. It reopened at some point, but it's hard to say. Okay, so what we have here is is the architect and her client, the one of the three richest men in the world and the first independent woman architect. They got along like gangbusters, is an old saying, uh, very well. And he respected her. She is one of the few people who could tell him no or you're wrong. Now um, William, right, William Randolph, she didn't call him Bill, but she said, or Mr. Hurst, I guess she would have said it that way. You can't do that. That won't work. If I build it that way, it'll collapse. And he respected her and backed off. Everyone else who worked for him, whether it was contractors, engineers, other architects, would have had him breathing down their neck and he would have expected them to do whatever he told them or wanted them to do. She was different. He respected her. And that's one of the more positive things, but at least their working relationship was very genuinely based on equal and mutual respect for each other. 
So here's one of the drawings she did uh, for a guest house. And we're going to see what that guest house looks like. And I think that's as, as far as we'll go today. It's spectacular. I don't know if you realize, I think, yeah, if you see by now, most of you should have seen the lecture that I'm talking about that is from the part of the syllabus where I mentioned Julia Morgan's and Maybeck's works. Um, I did say this, that it's not one building. You know, everyone thinks of just the main house, Casa Grande. Uh, but there are 16 separate structures on that site. There's your alliteration, 16 separate structures on that site, uh, which she designed, all of them totally on her. Now here, she didn't have any collaboration. We'll see the collaboration uh, work between the two of them on, uh, on Wednesday, because some of those are easy for you to see if you choose to go to, well, mostly in the East Bay. Uh, to, to take a look at some of the buildings that are open to the public or where you can just even take exterior photos for the extra credit option in architecture. Okay, this drawing is, is mostly freehand. She did use, of course, you know, rulers and measurements and things, but she was self-taught before she went to the School of Paris and before she became a student in Maybeck's class, she was already drawing very skillfully. And some of her artwork is in my book on Julia Morgan, by the way, which you should have, right, as part of the syllabus and required reading. You'll see, I think it's this drawing and one or two others that she did after being an architect. But before that, she also had uh, quite a, a, a natural skill, you know, self-taught before she started taking classes from Maybeck. Uh, for drawing of all kinds. So here's how it looks when you walk up to Hearst Castle, assuming if you do the, the main tour, there's four different tours. I forgot, at least one person here, right, has been to Hearst Castle. I think I remember, anybody is there now? If not, then yes. yeah. Yeah, okay, What you took the main tour, right? I think you said. Um, we took two tours. Um, we did the, and I don't remember exactly, but I'll call it the main building. And then we did, came back and did, um, all the buildings on the grounds, the exterior pool, et cetera, which was also just really impressive. Yeah, I think that that's included, but I'm not sure. They may have altered it, but there were packages of different things. If you do, do go in for the first time, you probably should say the main, see, see the main tour because that will get you into Casa Grande, which we are now going to take a close look. But look at the setting. Uh, by the way, the name, the official name is not Hearst Castle. It's La Cuesta Encantada, which means the enchanted hill in Spanish. And Hearst gave it that name. He never wanted it. He, it was named Hearst Castle after he died and donated it to the state of California, by the way. One of his nicer gestures. Okay, so we covered the structures. I'm not going to go about all, go into all the details. But for instance, she would hire, okay, this is another thing about her, I admire. She would hire architects, I'm sorry, contractors and, and skilled craftsmen and women, both, but most of them were men at this point in time because of the union rules and stuff of that obvious prejudice. But, but there were a number of women to work for too, quite a few actually, more than any other architect. Oh, but men and women who would be uh, trained in every country from, uh, culture. I mean, that had craftsmen who were allowed to come into the United States. And at some point in time, when the uh, racist, you know, immigration laws of the 20s, and most of you know about that, right? I think it was 1925 when the exclusionary acts were passed so that, you know, only a trickle of Western European, oh, maybe just European immigrants were, were being allowed in for, oh gosh, almost 40 years until uh, 1960s when they opened up. Uh, the immigration rules to a broader pool of people from other parts of the world besides Europe. At that point, uh, when that happened in the 20s, she <laughs> surreptitiously got um, craftspersons and then sometimes even their whole family to come from uh, China by some other means. I think it's through some Chinatown aid agencies, you know, that aided immigrants who somehow came for temporary, they were still uh, okay as workers, you know, at the way. Hey, yeah, this would be, you know, in Chinatown, there was still a, a, some quote, illegal, unquote, immigration happening even after that law passed. And she decided that people who were skilled in designing Chinese style buildings or buildings with Chinese elements, and she designed several of them, including the Chinatown YWCA, which is one of my favorite buildings. She would just not be bothered by the fact that the stupid law was, you know, obviously it was a racist law, was saying they shouldn't even be allowed to be here, let alone be employed. She would employ them and she, she protected them. They weren't deported. So there's another way she was way ahead of her time. Here she had a Swiss immigrant design this, the balcony, which is hand-carved wood 
She had some of, of the uh, sculptures here designed by, by women architect, uh, sorry, uh, artists I mean, who she had um, known when she was at UC Berkeley or met through either, you know, women's groups. She was active in a lot of women's groups, Julia Morgan, throughout her life. Or even was introduced to by Phoebe Hurst, who was trying to promote, you know, women's. Uh, I'm sorry, event. I do have a question. Yes, uh, go ahead. This thing that you did that cross up with the design, it's a, how do you call it? Tail, like mosaic, mosaic. Say it's again. Painting or it's a material. Oh, the materials. This is yeah. concrete. Okay, uh, which has a little thin layer of plaster, but it's basically concrete, blocks of concrete, because she wanted to be earthquake resistant. I'm glad you asked that. That's another thing. She was ahead of her time. She was a woman engineer, had a, an engineering degree before. Most women didn't even, again, they weren't even allowed to take engineering programs, or if they were, they couldn't use the degree because no one would hire them. She was only the third, I used to think was first woman in the history of the University of California on any campus to get an engineering degree, and she's the first one to use it. This building has been to several earthquakes. They have them in the Central Coast. You know, Some of them have destroyed buildings uh, in nearby places like San Luis Obispo, which is a near decent sized town to Hearst Castle. And yet this, not a crack. Not a crack in it. She knew what she was doing. And she designed some buildings in San Francisco and in the East Bay just before the 06 quake that again had almost no cracks or at least minor little, you know, uh, features that had to be, you know, temporarily patched, but they, no structural damage. So this, this is the proof of her skill as an engineer that this structure, and these are 165 foot tall towers, and it's, it's, it's concrete, but it's reinforced inside in a way that made it earthquake resistant. And then so this, like this is wood. Tower, this it's is, concrete? Yes, yeah, 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 with, with metal framing, but not up here. This is carved stonework. Uh, and then those are tile, of course, you know, painted tile. So the upper part, the bell towers are not concrete, but everything below that, yeah. See this here? Yeah. Uh, and, and she she knitted them. To, it's too much detail to go into now, but just the point is she knew enough about engineering to make her buildings earthquake resistant well before the 1906 quake. Now, this building was designed after that, but you know the California State Building Code didn't require earthquake resistant construction until after, what, 1933 quake in Long Beach? It killed 200 people. You probably never heard of that one. It destroyed the junior high I went to. The previous building, I wasn't there in the 30s. I'm not that old. <laughs> Our teachers would tell us, you know, you're on ground where hundreds of people died. Oh, really? You know, when we're standing around for nutrition at the break at my junior high in Santa Monica. It, that was a big quake, 33. And that's when the state started enforcing building codes. She was well ahead of the state and the, you know, the authorities, uh, building codes and everything uh, in designing buildings that were earthquake resistant. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see what time is it? It's 412. Why don't we do the rest of the Hearst Castle, including the pools and things on Wednesday, because they're spectacular views. And when we go inside the main house, it, it's like something out of a um, medieval fairy tale or something, what she was able to achieve. So we'll save that for um, a Wednesday. Okay. Uh, all right, but like I always do, I stick around to answer any questions that anybody might have about need to get a haircut. I'm going to get one on Tuesday. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, any questions about anything either that we've covered, obviously, or all, also about extra credit, or if you haven't gotten your your your, la your second paper in, obviously it's your last paper, uh, you know, it's only 10 points off, it doesn't go up, but I wouldn't wait till the week before finals because then it gets too crowded and too backed up. And I've seen that happen to people who have a hard time getting a good grade on their final if they have to also write a whole paper and then maybe in other classes too. Hey Mark, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, you sent us all an email saying, amongst other things, you were going to send a PDF of the nine elements of composition. Oh, that was a mistake. I hit. Thank okay. you for bringing that I didn't up. see it. I accidentally. Yeah. Well, no, I didn't because that email somehow, I know that was a glitch. I didn't okay. click on anything that said that, but I saw that in my out, you know, it gives you at the bottom. Well, you would know this. The faculty portal shows what you just sent. So I saw that and I meant to say that at the start today. I don't want to confuse people. Ignore that second email. All I meant to send was what worked obviously for all of you. Okay, here. thank you. Yeah, yeah, That's that was earlier. And then that's when I sent the, uh, the cover sheet. I know I already did that, yeah. And, and, oh, the nine elements, yeah. Well, you guys already know that from having written at least one, if not both of your papers. So you don't need to even think about that. Sorry, just delete that email. 
Um, I, I think that isn't likely to happen again, but, but if it does, for some strange reason, I'll, I'll try to make sure I say at the start of the lecture, I, I, I sent a, you know, an a, a extraneous email accidentally, and I don't even know how it happened. I didn't click on it, but whatever. Uh, has anybody noticed how your computers, I just, it's a quick question. I know everyone out there, practically everybody listening to me now is, is much more tech savvy than I am. That's almost a given. However, I've gotten better by far than I was before the pandemic for obvious reasons. And with the help of my daughter and uh, Michael Healy, I want to give credit to you. He, he brought me up to speed to be able to function at all on Zoom. I wouldn't be able to do it if it wasn't for as many hours he spent. Uh, helping me out because he was one of the first to make the transition. The point is that I've seen things like file. For instance, we go back and forth between two files. I think this happened. Oh, actually, it was in the evening class, I believe, last Monday. Uh, or no, it was this class on Wednesday from, from the main campus. I couldn't figure out why it wouldn't allow me to, have people have seen this, to access certain files that every time I tried to move the cursor over after I pulled them up from you know this bar here on the side of my screen, you probably can't see it. It's supposed to stay there so that, the, have people had that problem? I, I think sometimes computers have a mind of their own. Now that sounds completely paranoid. <laughs> but but i'm just saying you know there are things when they don't function exactly the same way the same process or same procedure appears differently on your screen from one time to the next or even between two or three tries at the same sitting i know i'm not making that one up because my daughter told me that she's as tech savvy as they can be at 18 she has to be anybody had that experience that well just curious Occasionally, you know, your files come up in different formats than the one that you're used to. And then there's what? Why is that? No, not me, but maybe it's because I only do like this class file. So. Oh, yeah, it depends <laughs> on how many files and what type, maybe. My daughter thought it was that I had, pre I think some of you were there. Yeah, she, she kind of leaned over, and didn't get her head in the screen and tapped some things and somehow brought up the file I needed to finish the lecture on Wednesday. But that's the only time that's happened during one of my lectures. But it does happen when I'm trying to do my, you know, preparing for a lecture or otherwise storing files and putting in new photos. Well, this one's easy. I just put in this uh, and you'll see it again on uh, on Wednesday, uh, you know, at the lower part of the screen where it just says USB device. And that one I don't think can go astray. <laughs> so I think you're going to really enjoy the ones of, of Hearst Castle interiors and stuff. And we may end early. We will probably end a little early. And then what are we going to do the week after that? We're going to talk about the exam. And I will pro probably show you, because we have two meetings each week, some of my Frank Lloyd Wright slides from the same really, really spectacular photographer that I've worked with on all three of my architecture books. Uh, and that's Frank Lloyd Wright's building on the buildings. Sorry, you had 38 of them, the 35 are still standing. That again, some of which are very easy to take photos of because they're right here in the Bay Area, Marin County, San Francisco, one in Berkeley. And that'll give you some options if you want to consider that. Uh, but that'll be next week. Okay, so um, we're done with the new slides. That's true, but I want to thank you all for your interest and and your participation, your comments, and, and interesting information about the alternative entrance to the loo. Wow, that's the first I've ever heard. Maybe we should uh, <clears throat> try to expunge that part of this <laughs> video before it goes on YouTube. Of course not. I could, of course, it was at the beginning. My daughter could figure that out. I'm going to leave it on there. So I'd be curious to hear if, uh, say, several weeks from now, there's a sudden rush of more people coming from the West Coast of the US or wherever people watch these YouTube videos, if anyone outside my classes does that. Anyway, interesting information. Thank you, guys. So anybody else have any other questions? That's what we're here for. Thank I have a quick one, Mark. Sure. Um, how many movies or like books can we watch or read to get extra credit? Like there's uh, got to be a I like to keep the two in each category. So like two movies, two architecture sites, two museums, and there you're at 60 points. Or two of my art theme novels, yeah. you know, and that's two in that category, and that's worth 30 points because you have to download those uh, from Amazon Kindle. Or, or um, let's say four articles because that oh, would yeah. be, right, 20 points which, you know, art related articles with a photo, you have to have some kind of illustration. Well, no, you don't, I've given you a break on that. It has to be over a page, not li like a oh. thumbnail, but an actual article about art and forward it to me, the link or a screenshot. That's five points each, so you can do four of those. Okay, so that gives you, uh, I think a reasonable variety of choices. I yeah. kind of want to broaden it out so that you get more. Hey, the question is, 
Any other questions anybody else has? I do have a question. Sure. So I went to the Casa Grande, I uh, hear up uh, Against Paraloma, the one that it's adobe. Is oh, it, yes. It oh, yes. As a, because, you know, it's a different structure, but it it's has the like, real thing, it's, isn't it? It's not a replica. Yeah. I, I've driven by yeah, it. Yeah, it's Have a you, real thing. Did you get into it, inside it? Yeah, I went, but I was wondering if it counts as a. Oh, that's a because... I, I've never seen pictures of that. Oh, okay. So I'd love to because see Because it's those. like a different structure and like different than the architecture that we are seeing. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's that that is environmentally sensitive design if it ever was, because it's right from the earth. I love adobe architecture. And of course, sometimes they plastered and painted over the plaster, but sometimes it's I forget that one is just the the raw adobe, I think. Is the raw, but the the um, yeah. the quarters where the family used to live, it's painted on the inside. Yeah, but, that makes sense. Does it did it have a floor? Because some of them had just dirt floors. Uh no, just the just the the rooms with the what, General they, Vallejo used to say. Did they have wooden floors? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. What, what kind of floor? Uh, no, it's the wooden floor. The main the, the quarters with the service used to live. It's, oh, uh, just dirt. Well, that's dirt, but the family quarter has wood. Is that what you? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's not uncommon. <laughs> yeah, the difference in the wing. But you know what? Julia Morgan never did that. When she designed servants' quarters, she made them as nice as the owners' sections. And she was told, "Why are you doing that? It's a waste of money." And she'd say, "Have you ever worked as you know a service person? Have you ever had to be you know poor? Have you?" Even though she was from a middle class family, neither rich nor poor, from Oakland, she understood what people had to do. Uh, not just yeah. women's rights, but human rights. Yeah, I, one of my true heroes or heroines is she was ahead yeah. of her time in many ways. Yeah, interesting. So, yeah, send me the pictures of that and just remind me, you know, that this is like old, a landmark on the old. Yeah, as long as you have four, I hope you have four photos. That's the rule yeah. to get 10 points. Yeah, I perfect. have the exteriors and the interior. Yeah, I did that to run on. That's wonderful. If you want to send more, you can, but the requirement for 10 points is just four. And just label it. And of course, your name in the class. Okay, well, that's exciting. I actually look forward to, to seeing those. And that's a good example. It's in Petaluma. And uh, I guess I don't know the address, but I think I vaguely remember. Uh, I think it's at Dover Road. Yeah, I think it's at Dover Road. It's like, and the name of it, one more time. It's a Casa Grande, I think. Oh, okay. It's interesting. Very same name as the one I heard. It's, it, because uh, I did the whole tour. Uh, it's, I think, that place is what the General Police used to live with his family. And then he moved to this pretty house that was put in so that is here. It's a landmark, home. right? Is it owned by the, yeah. the state or the uh, county? Or the uh, state it's a landmark. Yeah, it's probably a state historic landmark. And it is open to the public, you just said. Okay, I, it, it, I think it probably wasn't for a while during the pandemic. So there's an option for everyone to go. You can look that up easy enough. Okay, any more questions? Anyone else have or any information you want to share? All right, I think you guys have uh, really, uh, you know, I hope you've learned some things you wouldn't otherwise that aren't just on the syllabus for memorization sake or whatever. You don't even have to have studied except for the first slide, of course. But we'll finish up with Julia Morgan and Maybeck's uh, work in some spectacular slides on Wednesday and we'll still end early uh, on that day. Okay, see you guys on Wednesday. Take care. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you. Have a good two days.